As I suppose practically everyone knows, the world-famous athlete Oscar Pretorius shot and killed his girlfriend, Riva Steenkamp, a well-known model, early on the morning of the 14th of February 2013. Using his own gun, he fired four shots through the door of a toilet that led off the bathroom in his upmarket property where they were spending the night. Three of the shots hit Riva, and she died of multiple gunshot wounds. All this happened in the Pretoria suburb of Silver Lakes. Pretoria stood trial for the murder of Riva Steenkamp before Mrs Justice Masipa and two assessors. He was acquitted of murder, but convicted of culpable homicide, a common law crime in South African law, roughly equivalent to manslaughter in English law. In an earlier Law in Focus video, I, expe I explained how Matsipa J came to this conclusion in an application of the South African law relating to the mental element in murder. But I pointed out a puzzling aspect of the judge's application of a part of that law and suggested that it might be turn out to be important in any appeal, and so it has proved. The prosecution did in fact appeal to the Supreme Court of Appeal, and that appeal has now been heard and judgment was handed down on the 4th of December 2015. The Supreme Court set aside the verdict of culpable homicide and substituted a verdict of murder. The case has now been remitted to Matsipa J for sentencing for murder rather than culpable homicide and a much lengthier term of imprisonment than the five years originally imposed is anticipated. This video explains the judgment of the Supreme Court of Appeal and sets it in the context of the law relating to the mental element for murder. It will be recalled from the earlier video that Pistorius claimed from the beginning that he thought he was firing at an intruder who had entered through the bathroom window and that the death of Reva was a terrible accident. That Sipa J, from a close analysis of the evidence, accepted that this might reasonably be the case, that Pistorius thought he was firing at an intruder. And this meant that, whatever else might be the case, the prosecution's primary case, that after an argument between the couple, Reva had fled from Pistorius and taken refuge in the toilet, where he had in anger gunned her down. This was rejected. This conclusion was not challenged on appeal. In fact, it couldn't be challenged on appeal, because in South African law, an appeal by the prosecution could only be on a point of law reserved. So the appeal had to proceed on the basis that Pistorius thought that Reva was still in the bedroom when he fired the shots. It will also be recalled that the South African law recognises both direct intention, in Latin dolus directus, and legal intention, in Latin dolus eventualis, as sufficient mens rea or guilty mind for murder. Now, what do these terms mean? An individual has direct intention in regard to the death of the deceased when the death of the deceased is his purpose. But if Pistorius thought Reva was in the bedroom, killing her by firing through the door could hardly have been his purpose. So the focus of, of inevitably falls in the Pistorius case onto Dolus Eventualis. Dolus Eventualis means simply to take a conscious risk with the life of another. If the accused foresees that his conduct might cause the death of another, and yet continues, there is dolus eventualis, and if death does result, he is guilty of murder. In the judgment in the Supreme Court of Appeal, this was confirmed by Judge of Appeal Eric Leach when he said, and I quote, A person's intention in the form of dolus eventualis arises if the perpetrator foresees the risk of death occurring, but nevertheless continues to act, appreciating that death might well occur, and therefore gambling, as it were, with the life of the person against whom the act is directed. It therefore consists of two parts, foresight of the possibility of death occurring, and reconciliation with that foreseen possibility. So now the question becomes, did Pistorius, when he fired through the door, foresee the possibility of death occurring 
and yet he took that risk. As made plain earlier in the, in the earlier video, the prosecution needs to show that the intent was in fact present in Pistorius' mind. It was not enough that he should have foreseen death. He had in fact to foresee it. But the Supreme Court of Appeal decided that he must have foreseen death. Judge of Appeal Le Leach went on, as a matter of common sense, at the time the fatal shots were fired, the possibility of the death of the person behind the door was clearly an obvious result, and in firing not one but four shots, such a result became even more likely. But that is exactly what the accused did. A court, blessed with the wisdom of hindsight, should always be cautious of determining that because an accused ought to have foreseen a con consequence, he or she must have done so. But in the present case, that inference is irresistible. A person is far more likely to foresee the possibility of death occurring where the weapon used is a lethal firearm, as in the present case, than, say, when a pellet gun is used, unlikely to do serious harm. Indeed, in the appeal proceedings, counsel for the accused, while not conceding that the trial court had erred when it concluded that the accused had not subjectively foreseen the possibility of the death of the person in the toilet, was unable to actively support that finding. In the light of the nature of the firearm and the ammunition used and the extremely limited space into which the shots were fired, his diffidence is under understandable. End of quote. And so we have reached the crux of the matter. Pistorius thought Reva was in the bedroom, so he thought he was firing at the non-existent intruder and taking a risk with his life. Could he be guilty of the murder of Reva if it was the death of an intruder he foresaw? After all, as we saw in the earlier video, South African law rejects firmly any form of the doctrine of transferred malice. The intent of, for one crime, to kill X, could not be transferred to another crime, to kill Y. This was carefully considered by Ms. Sipa Jane in the original trial. And she said this considering the concept of error in objecta, which is crucial to understand in the law here. She said, error in objecto means where A, intending to kill B, shoots and kills C, whom he believes to be B. In these circumstances, A is clearly guilty of the murder of C. His intention is directed at a specific predetermined individual, although he is in error as to the exact identity of that individual. In other words, A intends to kill the individual irrespective of whether the name of the individual is B or C. There is thus in this case, says the judge, in the Pistorius case, there is thus in this case an error in objecto, so to speak, an undeflected mens rea which falls upon the person it was intended to affect. The error as to the identity of the individual, therefore, is not relevant to the question of mens rea. We are clearly dealing with error in objecto in this case, in that the blow was meant for the person behind the toilet door, who the accused believed was an intruder. The blow struck and killed the person behind the door. The fact that the person behind the door turned out to be the deceased and not an intruder is irrelevant. This is a very clear but entirely orthodox account of the relevant South African law by the judge. But when the judge turns to consider the specific question of whether Pistorius had dolus eventualis when he fired through the toilet door, she takes a different line. She says this, I now deal with dolus eventualis or legal intent. The question is one, did the accused subjectively foresee it could be the deceased behind the toilet door? And two, notwithstanding the foresight, did he then fire the shots, thereby reconcile himself to the possibility that the deceased could be in the toilet? The evidence before this court, Ms. Sipa Jay goes on, does not support the state's cont contention that this, should be, this could be a case of dolus eventualis. On the contrary, the evidence shows that from the onset the accused believed that, believed that at the time he fired shots into the toilet door, the deceased was in the bedroom while the intruder 
intruders were in the toilet. This belief was communicated to a number of people shortly after the incident. Did the accused foresee the possibility of the resultant death, yet persisted in his deed reckless of whether the death ensured or not? In the circumstances of this case, the answer has to be no. How could the accused reasonably have foreseen that his shots he fired would kill the deceased? Clearly he did not subjectively dis foresee this as a possibility that he would kill the person behind the door, let alone the deceased, as he thought she was in the bedroom at the time. This is what I called in the earlier video a real puzzle. It seems in the earlier passages quoted that the judge had accepted sorry, that the, the judge had ac accepted the defence's argument that to be guilty of murder Pistorius must have foreseen Reaver's death. It was not enough that he foresaw the death of the intruder. But this is just the argument that she has so clearly rejected. A mistake as to the identity of the victim, in her own words, is not relevant to the question of mens rea. The Supreme Court of Appeal has now made it clear that the judge was wrong in her application of the law. Judge of Appeal Leach, speaking of error in objecto, said this, It is necessary to stress that although a perpetrator's intention to kill must relate to the person killed, this does not mean that the perpetrator must know or appreciate the identity of the victim. A person who causes a bomb to explode in a crowded place will probably be ignorant of the identity of his or her victims, but will nevertheless have the intention to kill those who might die in the resultant explosion. What was in issue, therefore, was not whether the accused had foreseen that Reaver might be in the cubicle when he fired the fatal shots at the toilet door, but, there the, but whether there was a person behind the door who might possibly be killed by his actions. The accused's incorrect appreciation as to who was in the cubicle is not determinative of whether he had the requisite criminal intent. Consequently, by confining its assessment of Dallas Adventuralis to whether the accused had foreseen that it was Reaver behind the door, the trial court misdirected itself as to appropriate as to the appropriate legal issue. The conviction of Pistorius for murder followed. It would be fair to say that the judgment of the Supreme Court of Appeal breaks no new ground, but simply restates the orthodox understanding of Odolus Eventualis. From the legal point of view, it is a straightforward example of what an appeal court does every day, correct the errors of judges lower down in the judicial hierarchy. But the appeal court complimented Matsipa J on her conduct of the hearing in a blaze of international publicity. She did so with a degree of dignity and patience that is a credit to the judiciary, said the Supreme Court of Appeal. Perhaps the verdict of murder and the lengthy service that is the lengthy sentence that is likely now to follow will give some small comfort to the grieving family of Riva, but there is little enough that the legal process can do to make whole the lives ended or rent asunder by Pistorius's murderous shots.